Welcome to Multifamily Live. I'm Kim Yerusi. And I'm Jason Yerusi. Our mission is to help you unlock your full potential as a multifamily real estate investor. So you can do more deals, bigger deals, with less stress, keep more profit, and free up your time. Multifamily doesn't have to be a mystery. It's time to go live. All right, so welcome back to Multifamily Live. Super excited for today's guest, Ken Gee. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Doing great about yourself. I'm doing great. I'm excited to dive in here. Ken is the founder and managing partners of KRI Partners and the KRI Group of Companies. He has more than 24 years of significant real estate banking, private equity transaction, and principal investing experience. Throughout his career, he's been involved in transaction valued at more than $2 billion, much of which has included the acquisition management and financing of various multifamily real estate projects. So, Ken... Ton to dive in here. So two billion of transactions over twenty four years. I mean, you you have uh, not not staying the sideline long, right? So you've been active. What what was it that at the gate, of course, um, really got you into the direction of multifamily investing, and specifically just to, to form the company and really dive into so many transactions over the last twenty four years? Yeah. So good good question. So initially, uh, I started out. I, I went from my I got my undergrad from the University of Toledo, and this is gonna there's this is all gonna make sense in a second. Got my undergrad in finance, went to work for a bank in Cleveland. When I was at the bank, all my clients, all my customers talked about owning real estate, making a lot of money in real estate. And I got my master's in accountancy, went to work for Deloitte for seven years. All of my clients at Deloitte talked about making so much money in real estate. And, you know, they just, they were absolutely just killing it. And I finally said to myself, as I was working 80, 90 hours a week as a CPA, what am I doing? <laughs> I, I, need, I need to do something different here. So I, I went out, bought my first apartment complex in a small area of Cleveland called Shaker Square, 28 unit building. I was still working for Deloitte at the time. And uh, then we just you know, slowly started uh, buying individual deals. Uh, then decided that this thing should, it should be more than just uh, buying a, an apartment building and selling it and buying another one and selling it. So we went into third party management and uh, now, you know, fast forward to today, uh, you know, our senior management team's got about 15,000 units of experience under their belt. And, uh, you know, we've done a number of transactions, not only real estate transactions, but, you know, all our client, you know, we have been involved in our clients' transactions, as well as a ton of private equity work when I was at Deloitte. So that's kind of how it got, how, how I got into this business. And it's been a ton of fun. Yeah, I can imagine there. And so going into the position today, right, with the vertically integrated approach here, now, is it just your assets that you manage? Or are you also now, I, did you mention you're mentioning for other, other companies as well? And was that the initial approach from the beginning? Or did you, quote, start in-house to manage your own properties and then found that you, to, you had the scale and you could also accommodate others as well? Yeah, believe it or not, we, we first got into third-party management when we were in Cleveland. And it was because of uh, the run-up in values in 08, 09. Lots of outside folks started to invest in Cleveland. There was no real third-party industry, no, no group of people doing it in Cleveland because Cleveland had historically been an owner-operator town. And finally, people just kept asking me and asking me to, to manage their properties for them. And I finally said, okay, we'll do it. So, you know, a lot of things in life happen, you know, not necessarily purposeful, but it made sense, right? These, these, Assets were being managed by companies that didn't really know how to manage anything but single family homes. So it's very different to manage apartment complexes. And those properties were located right next to properties we owned. So it was hurting us in a big way. And I said, you know what, I, I really have to dive into this. So then about 10 or 15 years ago, you know, Cleveland is, uh, is not a growth market, that's for sure. But Central and Northern Florida are growth markets. And so about 10 or 15 years ago, I said, you know what, if we can do this well in Cleveland, Imagine if we had massive tailwinds, like huge demand, huge population growth, and just you know low tax states. So we went down to Florida, and uh, and now we, we we bought several assets in Florida. Then we decided it was okay. We understood the market well enough to offer our services to third party, to do third party manage, management there. So we currently manage about two thousand units throughout the throughout the state and we're continuing to grow some of those we own and uh, some of them we manage for others 
you know, it's really interesting. I always say that you have to be careful around the, all the ownerships around you because you could be the best owner on the, on the block, but the rest of the owners are horrible, right? They're going to bring you down. But you yes, threw sir. in the piece that I hadn't thought about. But if you go out there and take over managing their assets, it doesn't matter who the owner is. You can help turn them around and help yourself in the same point. So it's That's really exactly interesting. why we did it. Yep. I took that approach. How are you looking now where we are today, right? We, we've seen so much happen with, you know, cap rate compression, so much happen with just even where the treasury yield stands today, how much happened with just how much money's in circulation out there and just where pricing is currently. How are you preparing yourself currently today or even for the next, you know, three, five, seven years just on, on, on the landscape of just what you're looking at in terms of deals, right? Because we see pricing has just gotten very aggressive. And I'd be curious because, you know, 24 years, you've been talking 08, 09. Yeah, we saw that. Today compared to where we're seeing some of these um, past trends that have happened. Yeah, so what's really important if I compare and contrast 08, 09 uh, to what's happening now, it, it's, it is very, very different. Number one, we don't have a lot of individuals buying homes and just literally lying on their their mortgage applications. That's not going on. We don't have lenders who are making completely ridiculous lending decisions and un underwriting decisions. They're holding the line. So they don't mind. You can pay whatever you want for an asset, but they're going to hold the line. They're going to make sure you have a 110, 120 debt service coverage. That's important to them before they weren't doing that. They were letting you go below one and just assuming that the, the appreciation would eventually get you out of the deal, which was a terrible decision on their part, uh, but they, they wanted to get these deals. So the way I see this happening longer term, we're, we're, we're always very uh, particular about what deals we do. And we just really stress test them to make sure that we know, um, you know, we always buy with there's upside, right? That's just what we do. And with the markets that we're in, rents are growing like crazy. And we still find a lot of people who have not kept up with the market. And when they haven't kept up with the market, they're several hundred dollars behind the market. So we're seeing that a lot. So if we can make a deal work at today's rents, right? And we're, I always say we protect that downside and, and move cap rate some and see what happens. If we do that, then that upside is going to take care of itself. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of how we're underwriting right now. What does a typical deal criteria look for you? If you had your avatar deal that you go after, what, what does that typically look like? Yeah, plus or minus 100 units. Um, for, for the fund that we're currently deploying right now, uh, we just wrapped up a raise on our first fund. Um, so we're deploying around 100 units, BC class, multifamily only. And we're looking for value add. And it's mostly through uh, rent upside, either from physical improvements or, uh, or management improvements. And uh, believe it or not, we're finding more, usually it's more physical than management. Right now it's more management than physical improvements that are necessary to get, uh, to get the rents up. So that's what we typically look for. And we're, we're trying to hold for three to five years. Uh, that's what we uh, pro forma out. And uh, you know, it's our goal. We try to underwrite to a minimum of 15% annual return. So that's our, that's our deal. That's our avatar deal. And is that, a, is that a deal level or for uh, investor return that you look for? It's investor return. Investor, that's great. Yeah, that's now, what matters, right? You know, it's, yeah, of course. And, and when you think about here, you, you said something interesting. Now you're finding out it's a lot more management compared to um, before it was a lot more on the CapEx side. Would you find that it just, you find a lot of property management companies are more geared to construction, but miss the, the where you're getting the value and that you're able to manage it so efficiently, right? That you're capturing on that, not only just maybe potentially, you know, the rent growth, but you're finding the other income that could be added in. You're finding all the expenses or is there something else driving um, this narrative right now? Yeah, it's mostly the, the increased demand for our product. I, I, for some reason, uh, a lot of owners are happy to just keep their properties full. And if they're full, they're cash flowing, they're happy in their mind. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That, that, that's what I think they're doing. And we see a lot of properties that should be passing through utilities and they're not and all their neighbors are. We see a lot of properties several hundred dollars below what they should be charging, but they're full, right? And so a lot of people, you know, they they got beat up in 08, 09. They like being full and they like knowing that the as fast as they turn that unit, they're going to another renter in there. Uh, and so that, that's what I think is going on. I don't, uh, you know, I the market's moving pretty fast and in the growth markets that we're in, it's with good reason. I mean, there are people moving to those areas like crazy. And when you think about the BC class, this is why we love BC class assets. They are not building BC assets. 
Yeah. Right. They're building a lot of A stuff. And who moves into A stuff? Pretty wealthy people. Well, if you think about Florida, about a thousand people move into the state every day. That's pre pandemic numbers. I'm sure it's higher now. I, I just know it is because we feel it. Right. Those thousand people, they're not all rich. They can't all afford four or 5,000 a month in rent. A lot of those people are just normal, ordinary people. They need a place to live. So we have that increasing demand. We have no new supply. Think about your econ class. Price has got to go up. It just has to because everybody's fighting for the, you know, the a finite supply of product. So you, in a cycle like this, where, where you see Florida, you have this, like, you have this mixed thing, right? Where you have, just like you said, you have a ton of people, like you had a thousand pre-pandemic. It's, it's more now. We just don't know what the number is, but it's definitely more now, right? You have a, a supply constraint where there's just not enough housing coming on, especially in most areas, Florida itself. And that's a big push, right? So you look at it and you look at a runway here is that, you know, okay, so a market cycle comes up. Is it going to be as bad? Well, it, you, the B and C is as long as you, you keep yourself where, you know, household, household income can be approachable, right? And people can be there. Is that where can the downturn go? Because the, they, they have to live somewhere, right? And we're, we're at a point here where even in the A's is that that's where you start seeing some of your, your concessions happen. That start trending down and push those people into the B's. So it's a well-insulated area, especially as long as you can stay in markets like a Florida that, that can keep you with all the other drivers pushing forward. Would, would you, would, am I too far off base or would you? No, agree? no, you're, you're dead on. That's exactly right. When, when I talk to people about, because I have this conversation a lot, Aren't you afraid you're at the top? Aren't you afraid? Well, pricing is a, fa- a function of demand and supply. It's mm-hmm. that simple. One of those two has to break down. Yeah. You'd have to give me a reason for people to stop wanting to live in Florida. I mean, there's just, it's, this has been going on for decades. It just happens to be a little accelerated right now. All right. Yeah. So maybe a slowdown. It's the growth rate isn't quite as fast. It's still going to grow. All right. It might fall to 900 people a day but yeah. most most jurisdictions would kill for that kind of growth right, right. and or supply as supply would have to explode and you there's you can't build bc class assets yeah. affordably you, you just can't do it so one of those two things has to implode in order for me to get stressed out about florida that's why 10 or 15 years ago we went there mm-hmm. because it just it just makes sense do you, do you find in terms of um, your ability to transact, how has being vertically integrated helped you stand apart from other companies that, that maybe would be, you know, par or far on the acquisition side, but, but how has that given you the advantage to find deals? Yeah, two huge advantages for us. Number one is that vertical integration. And that's because we think about this, right? You're working alongside a colleague mm-hmm. and that colleague would be a broker, right? You buy, sell through that broker and they get to know you as a customer. And now, because you're vertically integrated, because you manage properties as well, they send you their clients to manage the properties that they sell to them. Now you're kind of standing next to that broker, helping them develop their business, right? And we make commitment to them that we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do anything to screw up their deal, or we're not going to do anything to make sure that guy goes to somebody else when he sells, right? We don't destroy that relationship. So when you're standing next to someone, your relationship completely changes. So then when a deal comes that they want to quietly market or the seller wants to quietly market because they don't want the whole parade of people, guess who's top of mind? Yeah, we are. Um, We are. Now, the second advantage that we have is remember I said we have a fund. Most people that buy go find the deal, they syndicate and then go raise the money. Mm -hmm. Well, when they, in that situation, they have to convince that seller to go under contract with them knowing that it's possible that they won't raise the, the equity, right? Because everybody says they never, they always raise money, right? That no one will tell a seller, well, I might not raise the money. That's not what they do, exactly. but some do fail. Mm-hmm. Flip that around, put the money in front of the deal, which is what a fund is. We've raised the money. The fund is raised. We don't have that risk. That risk is off the table now for us. Yeah. So when we talk to sellers as a buyer, we're a far stronger buyer, especially when you're looking at the, the smaller market that we're in, right? Most fund managers are going for three, four, 500 units, right? We're down in the 100 unit level. We, no fund managers are competing with us. We're competing with the syndicators. So we just have a distinct advantage. A, we have the network relationship with the brokers and B, we've got the money raised already. 
That's great. And how has being so hyper-focused on Florida, right? Cause it gives you, you see two approaches, right? So one is that you're going to hyper-focus on the market, right? So you're, you're well ingrained, but you're, you're limited on, 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 of course, you know, how many transactions can occur, which, you know, you're in a good spot, but then on the other side, you see the shotgun approach, right? Where, where you're, you're kind of anywhere and everywhere gives you more opportunities to deals, but you, but you don't know what side of the tracks you're on. So how has, how has it allowed you to be, you know, in Florida, how has that allowed you to really just continue to scale to $2 billion in assets. Yeah. So, uh, so what you just said is critical for us. And that is, it's not a shotgun approach. We we're in all these markets. We're operating there every day. I mean, I'm looking at a deal right now that we just, we just know it's under market. The rents are, there's a ton of upside in the rents. Why? Because we've got three or four assets nearby. We understand the market. We understand why it's a good market. We understand the risks of each market. So uh, yeah, the deal flow. Yeah, there's fewer deals that if you were looking in all 50 states, but I think it's so important, especially when you're investing with someone else's money, as well as our own. All right. But it's really important that you really understand that market and tick every box you can to minimize the uh, the opportunity for a loss there. Right. I mean, you want to do well for investors and no better way than to to start with really, really understanding the market. Yeah, absolutely agree. How how does your team look? And so I mean, maybe not the fun side, but how, how does your internal team look in terms of you know what, what duties do you carry forward, and, and what are some of the other pieces that you you put into the mix? So when you say my team, so our team, uh, like KR, KR partners, right? So so at this point, you have I, I would I would treat it like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, right? You you have the the acquisition arm, and then you have the, the management arm, right? And so and then in between, you have the asset management arm or whatever pieces. Where where do you, where do you like? Where do you enjoy being in terms of a? a oh, team? there's there's no question on on the investment side. Yeah, I mean, property management is a tough business, especially when you're doing it for others, right? Correct. Um, yeah, it, it just is. It, it's it's a tough business. It fits with what we do. That's why we do it. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to stop doing it. But clearly, the more fun part is the investment side. I mean, we've got probably 50-ish employees that are running around doing, you know, doing property management activities, as well as on our own properties. Yeah. But, you know, it takes that number of people. We've got five or six on the investment side. You don't need that many people. And whenever you can find a way to have a business with fewer people, especially in this labor market, it's far more fun. Yeah, that's actually a good point right there. The labor market's insane. And I, I find here that I have that talk a lot about, you know, being being market specific, right? Because of what you just said here and just yep. re- really compared to the being everywhere. And right. And typically, and, and yeah, I find a more on, 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 um, when, when, they're, when someone's first getting into this is that they want to be everywhere because it's that, that fear of missing out in that point here, but, oh, well. but you're missing out on everything, right? Cause, cause you don't know what, you don't know a good deal from a bad deal. So, so you have 5,000 deals in front of you, of which you can only look at seven of them. And by the time you get to, your time is so valuable, but in that same front for the seven you look at, you know, you could have two deals in Memphis, one's 7,000 hours and one's 150,000 hours a unit. And the 7,000 hour unit is a horrible deal, right? right. Because you're in the wrong side of town, 150,000 is a stellar deal but on the, on the concept you're you know over in idaho and you think oh it's seven thousand must be a good deal right and so you can't get off the ground or you do a bad deal to get out of the gate so it's it's really well positioned and i i just it's really good to, to hear it reinforced is that longevity comes with systemizing and finding the approach and just being honed in right because it, it's not like florida has been a new entry point for you we're talking you know 10 15 years you said that you've been into mm-hmm. this market here yep. um the 100 unit approach it w- it w- and with the fund, do, when you do each fund, is it typically just a, a new revamp of capital or is it still, you, you may char- target differently on the, on the type of property you're going after each time you go in there? Yeah, our next fund, we, we may have, we may split our, uh, our, our invest, our funds serve our investors, right? So some investors, um, first of all, all of them believe in real estate, right? Because they can see how much money you can make. Some of them like to turn that money. They like to see the, the the asset go full cycle, right? Because yeah. it's hard to argue. You bought it, you you did what you did, you sold it, you made a lot of money. I mean, there's no way to argue with that, right? It, yeah. it is what it is. It's done. I made a killing. I feel great about it. Others know that the more tax efficient way to do this is to buy and hold longer term and refinance, get your money out or get as much of it as you can out. Your returns really explode then because your equity in the deal is so slow. 
so so low. So what we may uh, we're we're seriously contemplating sort of a bifurcated approach, because we have investors that want to do both, and you know you don't want to cram a long term investor into a short term fund that or vice versa. They people want to be where they want to be, and believe it or not, a lot of people want to have some in this market, some in this type of deal, and some in this type of deal because they just know they need to be in real estate. And why not? Because when you have those longer term deals, they tend to be higher quality assets. They tend to just be more about cash flow and long term appreciation. So um, that's what we will likely do next next fund. We're just trying to figure out what's what's going to actually make sense. Yeah, as well said, it, it, you find that most investors when they're when they have the short term outlook here, it's just that they like to see it turned over. But once you turn it over once or twice, they say, can you stop giving me my money back? What else do you have? Right. And then you say, OK, this, this long term approach is much better because every time you give me my money back, I got to find someone like you again to go give money to. And then if I don't, then then I'm sitting on this money doing nothing. and I should have just kept it with you. Right. So I can see where that narrative definitely comes in. I mean, Ken, this is great, man. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciated your your narrative on, on what you're doing because it really yeah. uh, reinforces a lot we talk about. So really appreciate you for for anyone listening that wants to hear more about your company. What's the best way to, to hear more about you, the company, connect more uh, with your firm? Yeah, so probably the, be- the best thing I would encourage people to do, go to our website, kripartners.com slash ebook, right? It's an ebook that I wrote. It's not very long. Um, it's called multifamily real estate's a total game changer because I believe it is. You two can make uh, build massive wealth as a passive investor. Now here's the point of the book. It addresses two questions. The first is just like many of your listeners, they know there's a ton of money to be made. They're just trying to figure out how do they fit into this puzzle? How should they do? Should they buy a double? Should they buy a single? Should they try to go out and buy an apartment complex? Should they invest in someone else? What should they do? So I help them help take them through that process. And, and even what kind of asset to buy, apartment, you know, a medical facility, what, what should they buy? Then the second part, assuming they should be passive, because most people generally should be passive because they have really good full-time day jobs that they don't want to quit. How do you vet the sponsor then, right? Because that's the other critical thing that people need to focus on because you need, you know, you want to make sure that you have a good sponsor that you're working with or a fund manager because they're, you know, they're the ones that are going to hopefully make you money on the passive side. And the second half of the book talks about some of the inner workings of our business and what makes funds, uh, fund sponsors tick. Why do they do what they do? You know, how do you spot somebody that's in it for the short term versus the long run? So again, kripartners.com slash ebook. It's free. It's a download. And I offer it to it only because I know that a lot of people are facing this question and I, I just talked about it so many times. I thought, you know what? I need to write, I need to write something up here. Cause that's I think- fantastic. I actually, uh, one quick narrative is that people say, well, how, how do you know if uh, someone's in it for the long run? I say, go to their Facebook profile and see if they've had 96 different job titles in the last seven years of, you know, <laughs> everywhere from boat salesman to power washer to crypto investor yeah. to that probably doesn't mean they're in for the long run. And if they, if they have that, I'd probably ask them, you know, it is a seven or five year investment, you know, something that they really think they could sustain. Right. But that's well said. Thank you so much. We'll have that link here, uh, in our show notes and for oh, everyone listening. And thank you so much. Ken, thank you so much for being on the show. Super appreciate your time. Great. And we'll talk to you shortly. Thank you.